Hello everybody, my name is Fumi Inyoda and this is Public Eye. Today's topic is on our Marjorie's. It is said that there are 13 million children out of school in Nigeria, out of which 10 million are arguably from the northern part of Nigeria. Of the 10 million, it is also arguably said that over 70% of those might be our Marjorie. Now, what is our Marjorie? This is a system that's age old, dating back as far as the 1500s, and in the past produced some of the clerks and scholars of the time. In modern times, it has become something of a blight on Nigeria, with many, many children being homeless. Now, in the age of COVID, it seems that there's been some political will to do something about it, with all northern governors recently banning the practice in the northern part of Nigeria. However, is this the solution? Will this lead to millions of children getting the education and care that they deserve? Well, all of that will be discussed on today's program. Before we start, in our usual tradition, I would like you to say this. My name is Zainab Yunusa. Um, I'm a co convener and assistant field officer at Majuri Child Rights Initiative Sokoto. I'm here at Agor Community, Shiagari Local Government, Sokoto State, to visit the repatriated and Majuri children. Here with me is. Salama Alekum. Alekum Salam. Who was repatriated from Orubai, Zaria, local government of Kaduna State? He usually stay with his aunt at the same time with Malam. He fed from his aunt and study with his Malan. And uh, after studies, he go for hawking. He hawk granite and beans, uh, suya bean steak. Wara. That is what he did usually. So after the studies, he go for street hawking, as he said. He was very happy while he was told about the repatriation coming back to his state, Sokoto state. He said he was happy and he don't have any issue with his parents since he was repatriated, since the reunification and the community, he said everything is okay. He was happy with the palliative that was given to him by Almadri Child Rights Initiative uh, and uh, UNICEF. And he said he wants to study so that he will grow up in the future and become a policeman. That he wants to be part of people that will be given security to the state. Well, I'm with the father of uh, Osman. I asked him some few questions in Hausa, which he responded uh, as. So, uh, as I regard as we regard to the to his story, I asked him is he ready to send his child to school he say he's ever ready to send his child to school but uh, the only challenge that he uh, encounter now is he don't have his no he don't have financial status to you know take care of all his uh, uh, needs and um, if uh, Akri is ready to help him in that way he's ready to send his child to school Abu Bakr Sani Umar is also one of the Almadri that was repatriated from Zaria. He is very happy coming back to Sokoto, as he said, because he will come and meet his parents. While staying in Zaria, he said he usually go to one woman. He don't know her. They are not related, but she usually gives him food. He goes there for his food because he is handicapped. One of his legs is not normal. He is having issues with one leg. So he do go there to have his food, and from there to the Islamia where he studies. He's very happy to come back 
Uh, he don't have any any issue here, except for some of his peer group that usually taunt him that he is not educated. He don't have access to formal education, and he is hurt by that. He said he feel like going back to school if he have the opportunity, and in the near future he will want to be a civil servant and he want to own a shop that he will be running a business. Uh, he also extend his gratitude to Almajuri Child Rights Initiative. Right, welcome back. That's a brief look at some of the children who've been repatriated during the recent um, moving of Almajuri children back to their parents' state. I'm going to have a conversation about all of that as we go on. I will start with an introduction of the guest in the first segment of this conversation, and I will start with the lady on my left. Um, Helen Obiageli Oshikoya is a lawyer and child mental health professional, um, as well as a child rights advocate. She provides early intervention services, particular for, particularly for autism. She works with juveniles and children, and her scope of services include child and sexual abuse, addiction, and so on and so forth. She advocates for in inclusivity and equipping teachers with skills to handle special education. Good day. Good to have you, Piageli. It's, it's really lovely to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for your work. We have so much to talk about today. <laughs> All right? Okay. I will take, and I, my next guest also sitting beside me on my right-hand side is Mr. Mohamed Sabo Kina. So Mr. Kina is the founder and team lead of Almajiri Child Rights Initiative. You already saw a bit of their work there. Um, he's been running this for five years um, and is looking for sustainable solutions to the Almajiri problem on the long run. He has received several awards for his work and he has taken the advocacy um, to the Nigerian Senate, the African Union, and the United, States, uh, the United Nations regarding what needs to be done sustainably for our Majiri children. Good to have you, Mr. Kina. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Let me start with you and ask, you know, how did that happen in the first instance? Nobody really understands what, I've read the history, and I know that it didn't start, it started as something really honorable, you know, and became what it is today but what is it today thank you very much for having me once again um the situation with the almajiri children as we have seen um in, the, in our country is, is very terrible and it's something that um, has been a recurring problem in the northern part of the country as well as nigeria as a whole and it's quite unfortunate that um for decades successful government in the country, both those in the northern part of the country have failed to um, bring a more permanent solution to the situation. And we see these children and their plight is almost hidden in plain sight. We, as leaders, as people, we see them back in our homes, both ways, both in terms of the leadership and us as a community. I don't want to specifically go to the issue of the parent for now, you know, but um, we live in a constituted authority, we, 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 uh, and government as an institution has the primary responsibility to protect children from exploitation, abuse, and negligent maltreatment, even while in care of their own parents. So um, the failure for the government and us as a society to get angry at the situation of the children is just um, unimaginable. L let me ask you, Obiageli, why have we not gotten angry at the sight of our Marjorie children. I mean, we're going on for forever, you know, and we watch it deteriorate. Why do you think we haven't got angry at seeing children on the streets in that kind of deplorable situation? Because we've become insensitive as a nation. It's the same thing as when you walk down the street and you see a dead body, you move the other side. We become insensitive. We no longer have human compassion. And the reason why we don't have human compassion anymore is because there's no consequences. Because if the country was the way it's supposed to be, a child outside on the street, that's negligence. That parent will be taken to court. And if care is not taken, will be put in jail. Children are the benefits and the future of a nation. And if you don't you know, um, care for them and nurture them, they're only going to end up being a misfit. And that's where we are today. Isn't it because 
there's an assumption that this is a culturally acceptable thing. I don't, I, I'm not sure people think that the children are destitute. Sometimes you see parents with them or people who look like adults, you know, so I mean, but I'm... The thing about it is that, like for us in the South, we're so used to associating begging with the North. So when you see children begging, it's like, oh, those ones are from the North. When we were growing up, we used to see the Nigerians, they used to come and beg. And we used to associate begging with a side of the country. So for us in the South, it's just another Northerner begging on the street. And then if you see a parent, I say, oh, this one is even responsible. The parent is begging with them. But we fail to understand that it's, 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 a, it's a system that has collapsed in the sense that no child, whether you're from the north, south, east or west, no child should be begging. No child should be hawking. During the day, they should be in school. And after school, they should be doing something constructive. How did the system itself turn, you know, in the first instance? How did it turn? You know, because it seemed to me that there was a structure. Absolutely. I, myself too, I don't understand. That's when I began my own initiative to find out why. Why do we have to remain um, on this top with the situation of the children? But perhaps I should give a historical background of the Almajuri practice and maybe how it, it came about and, and all of that. So it started, of course, um, about in the 8th, 8th century when the Islamic religion was brought to the northern part of the country. And at that time, um, those that embraced it were the merchants, the traders who go around doing business. And as, um, they, as they move around doing their business, they move around with mis mis Muslim missionaries and teachers who in turn te teach uh, new converts and their families and children and all that, of course, with, of the Islamic education system, you know. So as Islam be, um, continued to spread across the northern part of the country, and there were more of um, either teaching center or schools that teaches um, families and new converts the Islamic education system, you know. And so that is how the um, schools were being established across to teach um, new convert um, Islam. Because of course, Islam lays emphasis on the need for you to have um, education, and you know. So, so uh, at, at, at those periods, um, people were being taught memorization of the Quran and recitation of Quran, and it's led up to the point where, by the the the, the, the way the schools were, were just um, either within people houses, the where the malonha or, or under trees, you know and children come and learn and they go back to their original house, you know, and it went up until the Osman, Jihad of Osman Fodio. And during the Jihad, it was institutionalized and it, as an education system for the part of the country and all of that. And at those time, at those period, at those early years, the Malams were supported by the community, the, the wealthy people, and the Zakat, this is a Zakat is a, a form of, um, a religious obligation for the for the rich to pay the so post. there was a structure there was, a structure there was an education system that had a structure, structure behind yeah it then. yes and it was supported by the state and all of that so and nobody go out to beg and then uh and in those time mostly the children um come to the mother land and they go back to their parents so there was nothing like boarding so at the point the the system the board the, the schools transform into boarding and then that is when the inadequacy comes in. And at that particular period, and, and about 1946 or there about when the colonial masters came, and of course, they, 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 they took over the authority then. The, the, the support that was given to the system in terms of finance to maintain them, and even the taxes that were paid to the, to the traditional authority then, that were used to support them, were all stopped. Of course, the colonial master introduced the Western form of education. So because of that dislocation, because of lack of continuous support for that system, um, the Malams have to result in other means to survive. And that is the genesis where um, it, it has now become a boarding st structure school where children come to sleep in, in it. And there was no more support from the traditional system to support them. And so they have to resort to begging within the neighborhood. So um, to support the, the mother and support the children as well. So that is the genesis of burden. 
of, of the begging. Yes, the colonial masters came and didn't of, of, of automatically want to take the system into their own system. It was interesting because in the southern part of Nigeria, specifically in the southwest part of Nigeria, you know, they did introduce Christianity and more like Western education, but people were able to marry the two. So, for example, many, many families in the southwestern part of Nigeria have both Christians and Muslim um, sites to the family. And I'm quite aware that even I, when I was young, because there was a Muslim side to my family and a Christian side, we would go to the Quranic school. I, I like to go at that time because they gave you sweets. <laughs> you know, so you could go to Quranic school, you know, at a, off school and then go to Western school, you know, at that time. Why was that not done in the northern part of Nigeria or was it done? Okay, so the reason why that was not done um, was because the colonial masters came with, of course, formal education and also missionary, Christian missionary. So yeah. that was suspicious for the um, Muslim in the northern part of the country. It was as if the colonial masters wanted to use the formal education to convert the Muslims, yeah. you know, to Christianity. And that is why this, the, 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 there was a, a bit of resistance or refusal to accept um, the former education in a way and all of them. It's interesting because then you see it was an attempt to replace, mm, exactly. which of course, yes, well. you know, I mean, those who had practices would then resist yeah. and became, and then once you stop funding it, of course, it becomes something that's an outliner thing. Absolutely. Like why would the parents and the communities support it? Why did they not provide an alternative for their children? A lot of people will attribute the continued practice of the Almagiri into treatings poverty, religion, and then culture. So this is the, what people you know, um, have categorized as the main factors, you know. However, I, after, I, I, like I said, I did a deep system. I was not convinced that these three factors uh, are indeed the reason why it went up, up to 2020, or two, two, 2000, or even 2020. Or, so I was not convinced as a person. Um, so I, I, I mark a black hole this hole in my own uh, tier of change to say that there must be another reason why not this because I, I could indeed um, counter all of those factors if you say it's a cultural thing I, I can counter it that it's not it's not really indeed culture play, played a role in sustaining it but it's not all about culture it's not also about poverty it's not also about religion all of these things can be condemned uh, countered in fact, um, human rights activists will tell you that culture, religion, and economic factors, which is poverty, are excuses that are being used to justify abuse and exploitation of, of vulnerable groups and which the children just fit into completely. So my, my own opinion as to why parents still send their children is they, they see the practice as a social norm, not a, not a culture and not a religion. And, but what social norm does to people who practice it is that they see it as, they do it to satisfy two things, their moral and economic needs. For me, this is one of the most important reasons why we, have, we still have this practice up to this point in time. For, I think for those watching to understand why some things have just gone on for a long time, because when you say, for example, that there's no alternative, I, I saw you say there's no acceptable alternative because people will say, but there are schools. You know, but then the other thing you said too is almost like people. I went through it; it was good for me. Why should my child not be able to go um, go for, uh, go for it too? And I've seen this happen with with sex trafficking, in working with people with self. Sex, parents know, for example, what happened to their daughters. Even providing information about what goes on doesn't seem to make a difference. Why do you think that's so up here? I, I think it's still, it still boils down to poverty. So you can't actually change things unless, as, you know, as my learning colleague said, you have to bring an acceptable alternative. alternative. Will COVID change the question? Because it was with COVID that we saw all Northern governors come together and say, we will end this, we had an interview, I think it was with Malam El Rufai, during one of the lives, when he said it will no longer, he declared that it will be gone. You know, I was very interested in how you make it go from declaration to a reality. So, in the first instance, 
will did COVID change everything? Do you agree that it changed everything? Absolutely. It, 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 was, it was like a catalyst to ignite the political, um, to turn commitment into action, the way I will, I will, make, I will say. For more than, even before, I was just telling the, the other person who will be coming that I engaged with the Nasara State Governor even before coming, before winning the election. Because what I did at some point was a, a, an election and accountability campaign to engage all the political leaders, the presidents, those contestants, to say, what are you going to do about this if you get into me? Give me some, you know. So, and I talked to the governor, who is now a governor today, and he, was, he showed that interest and commitment, you know. So, th this has been on the plate for, um, for quite some time. Um, because this is what I do, so I have engaged a lot, even the Kano State Governor, a lot, the House of Assembly members, Senators, and all of that. So it has been on their plate for uh, for long. So, uh, but there was that reluctance, uh, reluctance to do it, and then some for political reasons. Some people will not talk about it because it for, for political reasons and all of that. So we thank God for COVID. COVID um, exposes the multiple vulnerability of these children that. Um, it, unless you are okay, unless you are you are you are you are not responsible or you are not you are heartless for you to be because they cannot be on the street because of the virus and when they, they cannot afford to self isolate because they will face hunger they will they will, you know so that exposes that and everybody now it was not down on everybody that these children are indeed going a very horrible situation so the, that is when of course the northern governors uh, decided to take the, that action and. Not only the northern governors, even the European Union, the international. Is I think rather controversially, rather than care about the children, I think that COVID forced people to see that the children might be a danger to, to themselves. Them. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. Us. Yeah. That's yes. what I'm saying. Yes. Not to the, not, not, to, not the, to the not children. To, children. to, to us. To the to the other. Yes, to because the larger society, be which is most, which is a shame. Yeah. yeah. Well. Because it took something. Because already it was always there. Once again, we really care only about ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know. So that's why I'm I'm interested now in what the sustainable solutions will be. Because it's one thing to think so we are still dealing with COVID, which is of course why our set is empty. <laughs> it's, it's, it's socially distanced. But there will come a time when the vaccines will be here or solutions will be here. What are those? Let me ask you, what do you think those solutions will be? Like in, in, like in Lagos, I know that they are Islamic schools, but they actually teach. They teach maths, they teach English, they, teach, they, they run like a, a, a normal schooling system, but they do have their um, um, Arabic time, whereby maybe from the hours of nine to whatever, and then from one o'clock, they go and they teach them the cultures of Islam. They teach them what Islam is about. They teach them Arabic. So they have the opportunity to embrace the two systems, and then also, they are not sent away from home. Like, you know, when, you know, when I was growing up, I went to two types of schools. I went to military school and I went to Catholic school. But we had Muslims in those Catholic schools because the, um, in, you know, in Kaduna, I lived in Kaduna, and the, the family saw that there was something exceptional about the, um, um, the, the um, Christian schools, but they didn't constitute it as Christian school. They constituted as they constituted it as something beneficial for their children, because it wasn't a system whereby oh you could not come because you're a Muslim. It was open for all. So you, it has to be a system whereby you know it, you know charity begins at home. If you're not going to embrace the true culture of Islam in every ramification, those that are coming under will not see the benefits of having a permanent product. All right. Mr. Kina, speak to us about sustainable permanent solutions and recommendations that have been sitting there for a long time. The um, Quran education and the Western educations are not mutually exclusive. Um, they could go hand in hand. We have seen that. It's also the same thing in, the, in Saudi Arabia and all of those countries, you know. So they, can, they are mutually exclusive. They can go hand in hand. Because of this, um, the social norm I mentioned earlier, Okay, there's needs for you to specifically say you are reforming the system by addressing some structural and, and old ways of the practice around the fact that children will have to move from Sokoto to Nasara State for the purpose of, of, of Quran education. So the point I'm making is that 
it's not the, it's not for you to even say that um, uh, they, they, you can build an integrated school for them and you expect them to go to school just like the Jonathan school it was built across the country you know but a lot of them were not in use you know that is because um, there are some underlying issues that needed to be addressed first. A framework that ensures a shared responsibility between the parent, the government, and the community. In other words, let these children remain in the community or the nearest community to the original parent. So right now the schools are sort of like schools you go away to. Children, uh, parent in Sokoto, will give out their children to either Maryland and then the Maryland will bring them all the way to Nasarawa State for the purpose of this thing. And so if you begin, to, if, you, if as a government, you go and build school in Nasarawa State in your attempt to say you want to uh, put that child in school, you know, you will not achieve, it can, that's not, that cannot be a sustainable solution because of why um, education is not the only need of an Almajiri child. You have to think about his welfare in terms of feeding three times a day, his, where, where, where he sleeps and all of that. And all of these are very expensive for you to maintain as a government for years with that existing plan. 50,000 Almajiri schools scattered across the country and all of that. So if you are going to be talking, start talking about either introducing school feeding to all of those centers, it's an administrative mad, mad, um, um, nightmare. nightmare for anybody to think about. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back from the break, I will be talking specifically regarding what is being done, how sustainable is what is being done, and how do we really get results right after the break. Right, welcome back. It's um, Public Eye, and our conversation today is on our Marjorie system and the children and how, what to do really about the system going forward. We are now joined in the conversation by Yakubo Lamai, He's kind of like a colleague of mine <laughs> in that we have similarities in the, in the kind, doing the kind of job that we do, actor, producer, journalist. I mean, I didn't act or anything like that. But then he's currently the director general for the Directorate of Strate uh, Strategic Communications and Press Affairs to the executive governor of Nasarawa State. In, and that's uh, Abdullahi A. Suli. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank it's you. good to see you. <laughs> it's good to be back to Lagos. <laughs> the slightly mad energy of Lagos. And of course, uh, Mr. Kina is still with us. I want us to talk now about what needs to be done. Yeah. You know, and we'll start with you because before you joined us, there's a lot of conversation about what might be sustainable, what's not sustainable. I'll take it from COVID. Yeah. Because it would appear that COVID shocked some sort of political will in the direction of doing something regarding the Almagiri children or the system itself yeah. could you tell us where we are at with that you know incidentally when the um, the northern governors decided that the, there was a need to repatriate the children at the onset of um, coronavirus um, i at different fora i explained to them that in nasrawa state the governor had started a whole lot earlier one, i want to, i want i want to i want to break it down yes from that time i mean it's one thing to yes. have a manifesto plan it's another thing, thing particularly to, to, in Nigeria, to, to write, be right in the middle of it. Okay, let me tell you. Um, 15th of July on NTA, where he proclaimed to the entire country that, look, one, there was the threat of children being abandoned on the streets. These kids were, you know, without parental care, without nurturing, and they were easy prey for extremist religious groups and insurgents. And then, of course, there was the hazard of health and all of that, they were on the streets. We needed to do something about them. So the first thing he did, he set up a study team and then quickly sent uh, you know, the bill for the child protection law. Uh, I think in Nigeria, we adopted it. Uh, the child protection thing yeah. was in 2003. Yeah. And in Nasrasi, it was 2005. But it took 14 years. When the man came in 2019, that he now has been able to sign it and it's actually effective. So we're completely, we have banned, you know, street bargain, uh, begging in Nasrawa state. I mean, I hear you say ban and my antenna goes up yes. because this is a, it's a, it's a very interesting way to do things generally. When you ban it, you declare it gone, you know, street it's begging. Not, that's street begging. Yeah. I mean, it's for all things. We do a lot of banning in Nigeria. So we ban 
and with we and w w on the surface of it we no longer see it but where does it go you know that's very important how do you go from banning yeah. to actually ensuring that we get children back in school okay the, the model we used in national state was very carefully planned and quite meticulous we realized that any program that government decides to initiate about either reforming the almagiri system or seeing that you don't get almagiri children on the streets it does not for instance uh, include a good period of um, stakeholder engagement so I think that one of the first few steps we did in the trajectory of everything we did was number one, the governor called the Quranic reciters. Now, why do kids even go to the al Majri school? It's for them to learn how to recite the Quran, which is central to the entire practice of the Islamic religion. Now, politically, politicians, especially in the North, have tried to remain, just play safe, be politically correct, be diplomatic, because if they say to these malams, we're going to ban al Majiranchi, which is, you know, the, the sending these kids out, the, 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 you know, the malams can ignite their followers. You know how very religious we are in this country, where religious people, 90% or 95% of us, we're not really spiritual, but we're religious. Everybody carries the religion on, on his forehead. Mm -hmm. The governor invited the Quranic Reciters Association he invited the Sangaya Malams. Those are the specific teachers who actually teach these children. And he said, you know what? We, we don't have a problem with these kids learning the Quran, but uh, we don't want them begging on our streets. How do you help us reformulate this so that the al syndrome, or can we integrate numeracy and literacy into it? Can we even take them to a formal school? Or do you need us? to give you some stipend and some support so that it can be reformed because we as a country would not allow our children to stay on the streets. And that's the basic approach we did. I'm going to come back to what the result of that consultation was. Is this a kind of sustainable solution you're talking about? Does it sound like it? It's indeed in line with our thought in, I wish the, the commissioner of Kano was here. He was going to tell you almost the same because of the same approach that I was uh, proposing. Anything that anybody would tell you around this issue, it must have to go back to that level of where somebody has to play some role. It can't just be left in the hand of one person, either the government or all of that. So it's indeed in line with um, what I think will lead to a more sustainable solution. How did they respond? You know, what did they suggest would work? I think they were a bit evasive. It began to become some very long drawn conversations. So I said, okay, do, let's do this thing. Give me statistics. How many al do we have in the state? How many al schools do you people have? Are the al teachers all registered? Where can we see them? Where did they get these children from? And how are they being catered for? So we did all of the math all before, just around when COVID came. So that was the balance we've been trying to strike. Now, how we began to activate it into action is with the repatriation. What did we do? We gave them face masks, we did accreditation, we did medical tests for our own set from Nasrawa State. You know, we put them in buses that were air conditioned, they were social, we gave them pocket money, and we had officers that we informed the governors, except I think for Taraba State only, that was the first date. We sent 788 in the first set. It was only Taraba State that the governor said they hadn't received the communication. The state have the primary responsibility to take administrative, social um, measures to protect children from any um, from exploitation, negligence. Uh, this is this is in, in uh, Article 19 of the Convention on the Rights of Children. So the state are in right to do that. You know, yeah, completely in right to do that, and I support it 100. percent So I go back to the process that's going on in Nasarawa, which sounds really interesting in that regard. So we've had the consultation, we've had the buying. How uh, is this working? Law, yeah. How is it now working? When you're dealing with something that is concentric and so traditionally minded <laughs> you know how to i don't know how to pull is like onion and you you know you're trying as much as you can to see how you can you know peel everything layer by layer so what we're 
doing is we're not being politically correct, but we're being honest with them. Now, the schools are the homes of the Malams. And a child might come as far as from Sokoto or Zamfara or wherever and come to Nasrawa State. And in a room which four or five people are supposed to stay, may have like over 10 people staying. So you see, all of these has to be regulated if that particular, if we even need to support the Malam himself. Now, we're, we're, we're not shying away from the very hard work. That's why we started with statistics and data and getting them registered. So we now have some sort of a code of conduct. We have the Quranic reciters, we have the association of the Sangaya Malams with government, and we're right now on the same page with them because of the fact that when where you, are the kids now have they gone back to their parents why are they still at the isolation center some of them no no, no. if the, they've all gone back to their parents why is the insurgency in the northeast refusing to just go away when a little child can be easily conscripted he is vulnerable he's hapless he's hungry and then you know they give him distorted religious teachings and they tell him man you're going to heaven just do this so these are some of the things why the entire society you know really has to wake up to the fact that we have a clear and present danger in letting these children be on the streets like this is it possible to have a stop point a future stop point where there are no new children added to the streets because it seems like there are two levels to it the level where you rehabilitate the children that are already there you know, kind of like tinker with the system so you make it much more compassionate and effective and humane and then prevent new children coming on. Is that a... Absolutely. There's what we are proposing as a um, strategic implementation framework that will um, address the situation in this systematic manner over uh, a long period of time, not just a rush. Um, before the COVID-19, um, we call it the class. And the C component has three different meanings. The first is, um, is, to, is to mop up the children from the street. The second stage was to prevent more from coming. And then the third one is to institutionalize whatever model you have so that it, it becomes a, a solution. And, and it's completely the way to go. You know, um, because I mentioned the other time, unless you have it, you have a framework that prevents more from coming, you're not gonna solve anything. You're not gonna solve anything because if whatever you do for, for, for them now, and then more are still coming from Niger, from everywhere, it's gonna be, you're gonna be overwhelmed. So you need to have a framework that prevents more from coming, you know? So, so completely, absolutely, um, we must have that framework and the way to go about it is for everybody to stay within their their community or the nearest community to their original parent within their state. Yes. That is the, the first thing that needs to be done. And that's why I'm all for the Northern Governor's stance of relocating children to their, to their original state. That is where we can begin to implement any intervention from them. And again, the relocation of these children to their community is what I consider as reformation of the system. Um, that is, you are re restricting the migratory aspect of the al Majoran chief. And that is what reform means, not giving Malam money or giving them bag of rice. As, it's, that no, that's not reform. Even stopping that migratory uh, element might also have good security implications. Absolutely. In that regard. Absolutely. I'm going to, I mean, we're going to round up soon, but I'm going to invite, you know, comments and questions from the audience. Okay. I would like you to think through, because what I do at the end of the show is that anybody that comes from an institution, they must promise me something mm -hmm. which I can hold them up to and put before the public and say, let's do this together. We, our idea is never to shame because we realize it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. You know, what we do is that we can collectively have a goal, it's goal setting, you know, and even if the institution is not able to meet the goal, they say to us, you know, could we have five more months? Could we have one more year? Absolutely. We can communicate that and say, this has been updated. This is what's going on. Because as I said, if we don't have some sort of trust building across board, this extreme polarization across board is not going to work either. So I'm going to take a break. When we come from the break, 
I'd like to invite comments and questions to both of you from the audience after the break. We now have a virus that has hit the, the globe more than any other virus in the past. Because the devastation the coronavirus is doing is more than any other devastation that we have seen recently for some of us. So, and these children, they are exposed to this virus and nobody cares about them. When you lock down, one among them will come and get infected and infect all the rest and they will die and nobody cares because nobody even pays attention to go and test them. You know, because you don't even know where they are to go and test them. It is somebody you worry about, you care about, that you are checking. This one that are sleeping under the trees, that are sleeping inside the farms, that are sleeping, nobody cares about them. These are the people we are worried about. These are the people the Northern governors came together and said, no, you the parents that brought them to this world, take responsibility for these children. We are not saying don't send them to Almajiri school, but send them to the Almajiri school in your own home where they will go and study in the morning or in the evening or whatever and come back to you at home and take care of them. One scholar cannot keep 200 kids in one room under the same roof and wanting them to be better citizens. And with this COVID-19, it has made it worse that these children that are begging on the street, when you give them arms and the person that is infected is giving them arms, they will get, at the end of the day, get infected. And to go back, sleeping under the same roof, about 200, 100 people, they will infect the others and then we are in trouble. When you have a child, you want to give education to it will not be in consonance with Islamic practice for you to take your child and hand over to a person, to a stranger that you hardly know, who will take the child and you are at that time saying you have handed over the upbringing of the child to that person. Because what we are talking about are those formative years, most important years of his life. And that is the time that he would need that parental care, that parental attention to direct him. We all learned the Quran, but at home. And I don't know who can fault that. We got the Quran before we went to college. If it is going over the Quran, and most of these children, unfortunately, that you send because of the kind of environment that they are exposed to, do not often get the Quran at the time we got it within the recorded time. Because what the time they have to spend in learning the Quran itself, they share it, but the majority of the time is spent outside because they have to. The person they are living with cannot take care of their immediate needs. So what it is said is that at that tender age, go out and look for what you can sustain yourself. It's the most unfortunate thing that has happened to us in history. And I think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will not forgive us if we don't correct this system. Right, we are back and I would like the comments, questions from the audience. I'm going to start with the lovely lady in black and silver. Thank you. My name is Ene Hassan. Like Mr. Kiana, she said uh, they, they will need to mop the children out from the streets, the Almageries. How can you do that without changing their own perspective? Like Antifumi once also said that she took one and he went back. So how can we change these children's perspective from going back to the norm? That's Thank a really you. That's good question. Thank you. Um, there's somebody else who wanted to... Could you pass the microphone? Thank you. Mopping out the children from the street, um, banning them from the street, will it be something that will be sustainable for a long period of time? Because you can ban them for one year, and then after six months, three months, they still go back to the street. So what can we do? to prevent this from happening. Let's take those two questions sure. and then we'll go to the other side after that. Who wants to start? Who wants to go first? I think that one of the deliberate things you can do to make sure they don't go back to the streets. First, I'd like to recall what the antecedents of the, uh, the former Emir of Kano, Emir Sanusi, Lamido Sanusi, who took it upon himself to, began, to begin some uh, lectures where he was explaining to people the essence of marriage, who is fit to marry, how you can marry, how you can have children. And if you don't have some of these, there were some of the 
things he wanted to bring to bear reality with, uh, you know, uh, religious injunctions as well as the social norms which people have imbibed, which is really not religious. For instance, begging on the street is not Islamic. It is a norm that they have picked up from wherever. And then, of course, even the al Majirenchi itself was not supposed to be to cohabit with um, begging or allow begging to become, you know, synonymous with al Majirenchi. So for each time a politician or a leader would say, I'd like to stop this, you need to go to the religious leaders. As far as I'm concerned, I think you need their buy-in because they would help enculturate their followers to the bane and to the damage that this thing actually does. It is better for us to modify together or reform together. Your children will come from home to a particular malam and then they would go back. So when you're able to adapt some of these standards or the norms that these people do, that is acceptable by the malams themselves, as well as the, the clergy, the religious people and the parents, it's easy for you to convince your child that there's no need for the child to go back on the street, rather than us just dealing with the children alone, mopping them off the streets. And then after some time, when the palliative is over, they think they want to take the, you know, the head back to the uh, to the street as well. And that also would help with the sustainability of it all. I, I have a question follow up on it, but I wanted, you know, I wanted Mr. Kina, and that's Mohammed. I wanted you to address, did you, do you agree with this? Do you have any form, further co comments on that? I have a policy document which I will share with you as well. And the first recommendation of that policy recommendation um, is the information intervention I said, and that is the enlightenment. Okay, um, just what he's saying. You've got, to, you've got to develop those messages that will appeal to their conscience, okay? And one of, part of the inspiration I have also to start this is because um, I was part of a, a res qualitative research with some team from London School of Hygiene on the issue of maternal and neonatal deaths in the northern part of the country, where um, um, people are, 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 have been are practicing the old ways of ch um, issues re relating to childbirth and that contributed to child mortality and all of that. But there have been intervention around changing their mindset to accept new, new practice. And I, I saw how very old women, you know, were telling me about some of this new practice, you know, and then saying that they have stopped those old in this way of doing things. So, and, but that was achieved because there was a consistent and persistent information intervention about the new practice, consistent one, not just one day or seminar. It was consistently, and that changed their mindset. So the first thing I keep saying is that we need to have this strategic engagement and, and enlightenment for years, not just one day distance, because this is a mindset we're trying to change. So of course, I completely agree. I want to take two comments from this side, and I will start with the lady. OK, um, thank you so much. I really learned a whole lot today. Uh, but coming from the place of um, nature and nurture, I was um, thinking that is there possibly a way that um, poverty, they say, affects the mindset. So is there possibly a way that maybe some of these parents can gain vocational skills? So now if they gain these vocational skills, they'll be able to fend for these children because it's not like most of them are not aware that at the Amal Jiri schools, the children are begging. So when they don't have the means to take care of these children, they even see sending them away as a means of getting a whole lot of um, responsibilities off their back. So maybe if um, some of these parents, they are self-sufficient, probably they'll be able to um, actually enlighten the children and um, help to change their mindset. Because if they keep on sending them out there, you know, just pushing them away, the, the, there's, there's no place of, you know, nurture for those children because they don't have the right love, they don't, they don't have um, the right mindset that they need to actually become better people. And I feel like it actually starts with these parents. So if these parents are actually self-sufficient, maybe there will be a reduction in what we see. Like she said, the parents should be self-sufficient, but looking at the things in our environment. Some parents are also begging with their kids. Like in my area, I noticed that two to three years back when they were contesting for the election, they said free food for school students. 
During that time, I noticed that the Alemanjiri in my street, they are not that much. Many of them are going to school. But when they went to school for two months, three months, no food, they came back to the streets. And I noticed that there were more. Even the little babies are begging. So how can we stop the parents from begging? The parents are also teaching their kids to beg because the parents are not yet ready to be self-sufficient. So the kids will not want to be self-sufficient. Like now, a dad carrying his daughter to beg, pretending to be blind. So how do you want the child to say that, oh, my daddy is not doing the right thing? For in our mind, the dad is doing the right thing. So the parents will be self-sufficient. I mean, thank you. There's a lot that's come out there. Yeah, You know, I true. can see similarities in many of it. But it would seem that there's a, con there's a conversation now about social, economic, infrastructure and development. Correct me? Absolutely. It Absolutely. So, too. Mm -hmm. so where is the place of that in making these changes? That is why you need the buy-in, you know, of those who are, quote-unquote, the clergy, the imams, the malams, the ones who the people, quote-unquote, trust your teachers, your moral guides, your beacons of, you know, religious piety. It's true you will get to know God. So tell us that this is wrong. This is not acceptable in the religion as well. So outside of every other thing else that we would do that has to, of course, deal with poverty, you know, uh, restlessness, youth restle restlessness, unemployment, and then everything else we have discussed, I think we should also integrate in the fact that we need some sort of engagement that is why consistently for 50 years, even while we get Western educated, every time religion is thrown up, people who are educated will quickly turn and then fight each other. Neighbors, you know, Jaws, I was born in Jaws, you know, you and all of that. So we need to come to the point where we begin to really have a deep understanding, even of these religions that we're doing, and at the same time connect with people as human beings. But more than that, the religious people, the, you know, the people who guide the masses should, you know, take up that moral responsibility of teaching them the truth of what they should do so that collectively we can build our society. Government, of course, will also not shy away from, you know, the social infrastructure, the economic incentive to make sure that, of course, you know, poverty and penury does not push somebody to a point where he becomes, uh, you know, uh, a threat to society. Can you promise me that Narasarawa will take on parents of our majority student children into some of this scheme? Absolutely. How many can they take? Well, um, I mean, I'm putting you. You don't even have to answer me now. Yeah. You can come back to me, and I will put it on the, that this is what Narasarawa is doing, and I will promise that when it is done, I will let them know. No I think problem. That we will need to know. I would like you to think through some of this this program that you're doing already how many will take on specific people that we can identify as parents of our majority children and how many would who well, how many of those children who come out from that process will go into a school system we can identify also so we can hold it up as no, a model no problem we i can give you my word that i won't even be the one to say it would get recorded his excellency would say it the governor engineer abdullah isuli would say it we have the statistics and they're the people we're looking to see we lift out of you know this particular so we certainly want to set up the model and put it out make it visible for others to also emulate so mohammed can me and you be on them with uh, this no, absolutely um, that is my job here is to hold them accountable. I will help, help you, you know, really hold, hold him and his excellence accountable on this. And that's my job. I want to build public trust, you know, and I want to challenge institutions and leaderships to have goals and to meet those goals. That, that's been our program today. I thank you all for watching. As I say always, you can join the conversation. This show is just to support the conversations. The conversation continues on all our platforms, YouTube, um, Twitter and um, Instagram. Join us, send us your stories, send us information, and we will do our best to challenge our leaders, set goals with them, and you will join us to watch them. Remember what we say on the show watch yourself, for we are watching. We'll see you again. Bye bye.